there are not a lot of things that happen in our lives that cause us to say, man, that changes everything. As I look back on my life, when I was 15 years old, a sophomore in high school, God clearly called me to be a preacher of the gospel. And you have to understand, I couldn't even talk to a girl, so I'm like, God, are you kidding me? Are you hilarious? You're calling me to communicate your good news to people, and I can't even talk to a girl? And yet, that calling and my response to it, well, it changed everything. Later, meeting and marrying Teresa, who had become my wife, changed everything. Then, having three daughters changed everything. Right, parents? Having kids will kind of sort of do that to you. Later on, many years later, God would commission us to leave traditional church and with eight people and no money, start a church from scratch in the second most unchurched county in all of America with the crazy vision to reach thousands of people with the glorious good news of the gospel. And that leap of faith changed everything. There's not a lot of things that we can say in our lives. Man, that changes everything. But there is something that I have discovered and many people that I know and love and do life with have discovered that changes everything. And it happens to be the subject matter for the next six weeks of a brand new year called 2020. If you're just joining us, I'm so glad to have you as a part of this conversation. This one thing that I have discovered I hope you'll discover. And if you've already discovered it, I hope you'll discover it afresh and anew. It is God's best and loftiest idea. It has the power to change the entire universe. It's like the magnum opus, the Super Bowl, and the mother load all in one. It is so stunning, it is so staggering that no matter where you find yourself in your own spiritual continuum journey, there's nothing like it in the world. It changes your perspective on this life. It changes your eternity in the next life. It changes how you see God. It changes your identity. It changes your attitude. It changes your family, your marriage, your, your child rearing, your parenting. It changes the course of your entire eternity. I'm telling you, friends, when you get this one thing, I mean, really get it, it changes everything. What is it? You know how they tell you to start a new year, there's a new craze out called the one word deal. Anybody here, a friend of mine, John Gordon, came up with this years ago, came up with this one word. Anybody know about the one word deal? Anybody? Okay, one, two, three, four. Apparently, it's not as popular as John thought it was, and he's a buddy of mine. I'll have to let him know, send him an email. Uh, but <laughs> the idea is to start a brand new year, not with a phrase, not with a statement, but with one single word. And the hope is with this one word, that you will uh, be reminded of over and over again that there will be life change. There will be more clarity, more passion, more purpose in your life. Well, a few months ago and even a few weeks ago, as I began to think and dream about what God was doing and is doing and wants to do in and through our church in 2020 and beyond, this is the word that I would choose for us to be known for. This is where we are going as a church. This is our future. And it's the word... Grace. And the reason I bring that up is because there's not a whole lot of things in life that we can say, man, that changes everything. But guess what? Grace, I'm telling you, grace changes everything. West Cobb Church and those of you watching online, those of you new here since Christmas maybe, one of the greatest longings I have as a pastor now that I'm in the northwest corridor of Georgia kind of Cobb and Paulding County, kind of Marietta Powder Springs, is for our church to be known for something more than being against something. So many churches these days are known for what they are against, not what they're known for. Uh, let me give you an example of some organizations, these four organizations. Why isn't Weight Watchers known for being against fat people? Why isn't AA known for being against drinking alcohol? Why isn't CrossFit known for being against laziness? Why isn't Shopaholics Anonymous known for being against Amazon? The correct answer is, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know, my best guess, is these organizations are successful not because of what they're against, 
but because of what they're for. And so many churches rail against this and that. There's all these political conversations and culture conversations and social issues. Eight out of 10 people, when they're asked about the church, they have a negative connotation. And the reason is they went to a church. And the church sort of says, we have all the answers to the world's problems. We're here to fix you. We have our act together and you don't. And you're what's really screwed up in the world, you lousy sinner, you. Come to grace. <laughs> yeah. And if you think I'm over-exaggerating in the culture we're in in America these days, Dave Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons did a study along with Pew Research and Barna. And they especially asked millennials, the next generation, really. And here was their finding. Millions of young people see the church as judgmental, hypocritical, anti-homosexual, too political, insensitive, and boring. Can you blame people for bailing out on the church if that's really true? Because I can't. And that is sad, friends. That's the impression that a lot of churches have left people. That's how we portrayed ourselves as churches or as Christians. And yet, as I put on God's glasses for 2020, see what I did there? As I put on God's glasses for 2020, as we move into the future of what God's calling our church to be about the business of, as we go into what's next for our church, I clearly see what God is commissioning our church to be, which is a place of amazing grace. Now, some of you know 2020 vision, ophthalmologically speaking, is basically normal vision acuity at a distance of 20 feet. Just so you know, 2020 vision isn't perfect vision, it's standardized vision, it's pretty good vision. And I didn't even know this, some of you may know this, do you know what the number one surgery performed in America every year is? It's eye surgery, it has to do with cataracts. Cataracts, it seems, can make your eyes cloudy or foggy or unclear, and the idea is they come in and they cut out the cataracts and remove it so you can have be restored maybe to 2020 vision. How many of you, I'm just curious, have had some cataract surgery? Lift your hands, okay? Great. Some of you have never lifted your hands in church, and you got to do it. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> Eye surgery. Over 3 million Americans every year, cataract surgery. And you know, there's a lot of people that I meet who have foggy vision, fuzzy vision, unclear vision when it comes to what I'm talking about today and what God longs to have happen in their lives and in and through the local church. West Cobb, if we want to see God do what he wants to do, if we want to become the church that God dreams for our church to become, we have to have a clear, compelling, non-foggy vision for what God is commissioning us to do. And so what a lot of organizations do, if you're a CEO, a president, a leader of an organization, you know this, mission and vision are huge. They are really big, right? Mission is why we exist. This is in your outline on the back of your program if, if you're taking notes. Mission is why we exist. If you're here today at our church and you're wondering why we exist, why we're here, if there's any fuzziness or non-clarity, here is why we exist. We are a family on a mission to help people find and follow Jesus. That's why we exist. We exist to help people find Jesus, that's evangelism. We exist to help people follow Jesus, that's discipleship. This year, we will ramp up our evangelistic fervor, Super Sunday at West Cobb and other things, Easter, maybe like never before. This year, we will ratchet up and down our discipleship. We will grow higher and deeper in grace than ever before as we follow Jesus, as we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's part of the business that we're in. Vision, though, is what we are becoming. And as I've been praying about this, and I've been thinking about this, we are transforming our church into a place of grace where, watch this, believers are growing in grace as we build bridges, not walls, bridges of love and acceptance to our community and beyond. That's who and what we're becoming. Now, notice where it starts. It starts with us. It starts with the church as believers are growing deeper and deeper in grace. And so for us to get there, here's what's going to have to happen. Newsflash. Our culture is going to have to change. Our culture, Pastor? College football, I think the bowl games ad nauseum, it's like the 3M 
Publix, Fram oil filter, NASCAR, tortilla bowl. You know, I was like, whoa, all these, tier, all these different bowl games that nondescript. Finally, we're down to, I think, one college team, right? And uh, by the way, I can 100% guarantee you that the Tigers are going to win. You can put your money on it, all right? <laughs> A few of you know what I'm saying. Well, Dabo Sweeney and the Clemson Tigers, if he was interviewed, and he has been, he would tell you that here is when it changed for the lowly Clemson Tigers from lowly Clemson, South Carolina. Years ago, there was a culture change. And it wasn't their decision to win the national championship. Every team wants to win the national. It was their decision to change their culture. And so the, again, this year, they're going to the national championship. Now, the mission and vision of an organization are huge. There's no doubt about that. Patrick Lencioni, I've been with him a few times, written some great books on teamwork, making the dream work, five dysfunctions of a team and others. He says that culture trumps everything else in an organization, including vision. About a year ago, we had Sam Chan, a leadership guru down the road, a great church, Westridge Church over in Dallas. Brian Bloy's pastor, buddy of mine, great church. And he said, culture eats vision for lunch. Think about that. You can have the greatest vision statement. Here, here, you, know, you can have a nice saying on your mug. But if your culture doesn't represent, if you're not living out the values of the vision and mission, you're only pretending. You're not accomplishing much. And so West Cobb Church, from the very outset, before I ever became your pastor here, I said to the search team, I am a part of creating a space and place of grace for people far from God to find Jesus and people who have found Jesus to leave religious legalism and the requirements of the law and go deeper and deeper in the gospel of grace. They said, great, that's what we want. But culture is hard because change is hard. So we're creating this culture that everything we do would be based on the gospel, the gospel of grace. I'm talking about God's one decision to ravage a people by love, to come to our rescue and restore our lives through the finished work of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. I'm talking about how we no longer live under the nasty requirements of the Old Testament law, but we live under this thing called grace because grace changes everything. Stan, you're always talking about grace, grace this, grace that, a place of grace. Aren't, aren't you tired of talking about grace? And oh, by the way, I've had people say this, criticize. Aren't you teaching grace so much that you're giving people a license to sin? First of all, do you really need a license to sin? Like last time I checked, none of you have a sin license in your wallet or purse, right, ladies? You sin quite well without one. In Blue Like Jazz, uh, Donald Miller, who now is overseeing what's called storybrand.com, he's the CEO, he said this, I used to get really ticked about preachers who talk too much about grace because they tempted me to not be disciplined. I figured what people really needed was a kick in the butt. I believe that if word got out about grace, the whole church was going to turn into a brothel. I was a real jerk, I think. And so, no, you can't talk too much about grace. And the other reason people give that, you know, you're giving people a license to sin is they don't really understand the transforming power the unconditional love, the complete acceptance that's been made of the adoption, the sonship, the daughtership, the, the freedom that we're really talking about. So we have to be about this business of helping people understand and live in this culture of grace. Go with me for just a moment to the last days of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. He's with his disciples who remain, and I can only imagine they're around a little campfire and he asked him a question. He says, who do people, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Oh, well, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the other prophets. Great. Now, he gets a little more point and say, okay, but who do you say that I am? 
crickets around the campfire. Until Peter, of all people, right? Peter says, wait a minute, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the one above whom God gives favor. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are right, grasshopper. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. I am the Christ. I am the great I am. I am the one upon whom the church will be built and the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. The Message Bible translates it this way. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. A church, watch this, that will become so unstoppable, an unstoppable force of love and grace that so permeates a culture and a society that everyone's life gets transformed one life at a time. Believers get built up in grace. Seekers far from God find Jesus and find grace, and everyone's life gets so changed, and these disciples make disciples who make disciples. And when Jesus refers to his church, he's not talking about, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the building, and where's all the people? It's not a brick building. It's a movement of a people on a mission to help people find and follow him. And so over the course of the next six weeks, I'm gonna commission each and every one of you, wherever you are in your life, best you know how with God's help, we're gonna build every single service, start to finish, one upon the other, on the subject, grace changes Everything. It changes your perspective on life. It changes your identity. It changes your attitude. It changes your level of generosity. It changes your relationships, your marriage, your parenting. It changes the course of your eternity. West Cobb Church, if we're going to become the church that God longs for us to become, we're going to transform our culture, and this is the year to do it. Our 2020 vision. A little bit of truth telling today, a little bit of confession. I haven't always felt this way. If you're unaware, I was raised in a Christian home. Nine months before I was born, I'm quite sure I was in church. My mom and dad loved the Lord, but my dad was a chief master sergeant in the United States Air Force, which gave me a great respect for the land that I love, America. To this day, when the national anthem is sung and I put my hand on my heart, even at a ball game or even watching on TV, it just it grips me a little because I love America that much. But it also brought, because my dad was a chief master sergeant and a military dad, it sort of brought brought a performance-based mantra where, you know, if you do this, then I'll do that. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. Quid pro quo, whatever it might be. Sorry. And so I had to make good grades in school, and guess what? I did. I had to please my mom and my dad. Of the four boys, I pleased them the most. I had to win at every sport I played because I hate to lose, still do. Unfortunately, though, that performance-based mantra followed me into the church, into religion, all too well. And I won't take the time today. We're gonna play it out a little over the next five or six weeks. I understood I'd been saved by grace. Quite frankly, if you're saved, it's the only way to be saved because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a free gift. Otherwise, you would boast about it. So you're saved by grace or you're not saved at all. So I knew I was saved by grace, but then, okay, God, now I'll help you out and I will be a good little Christian and I'll do this and do that and I'll say this and say that and I'll act this way and I'll never act that way. And I would try and try. I would dedicate and rededicate I would make New Year's resolution after New Year's resolution after, and by Valentine's Day, I would forget what my resolution was, and so will you, hoping somehow, some way that I could please God, that I would obey everything he laid out in his word, which was impossible on my end. And you know what that led to? Futility, frustration, disappointment, and discouragement. And I'm just guessing in a room this size, In an audience like this, some of you can relate to my struggle. So over the next, it's why it's going to take a six-week conversation to sort of help transform the culture, understanding much better who God is, and watch this, who God says you are. 
Next week, it's grace changes my identity. I believe in America, we have huge identity theft. And we're gonna talk about gender identity. We're gonna talk about sexual identity. We're gonna talk about spiritual identity. Don't miss next week. Grace changes everything. Today, though, is just a perspective deal. I just wanna get started. I've done some reading over Christmas. By the way, Christmas kind of, it felt like a hangover this year. I'm not talking about alcohol here, okay? But right, it doesn't feel like, okay, we're finally getting back at it, getting back at it. It feels like there's been a bit of a hangover. But here you are, I'm so glad you are. But I was doing some reading. A.W. Tozer, great guy. Here's what he said. What comes into our minds when we think about God, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And if that's true, which to a great extent I believe it is, I want to begin the year by asking you a perspective question. Who is God to you? Who is God to you? When you think of God, do you primarily think of God as a rule maker or a grace giver? Well, how do I know? Do you primarily view God as a rule maker or a grace giver? Do you know God as someone who makes rules or commands for you to follow and obey or primarily as a God who has graced you, dispensed grace that is more than sufficient in any time of need that you have? This is such an important question because our belief in who God is, sort of shapes who we are and our behavior, our actions, our activities. The belief that we have in God defines the parameters of our future possibilities. For example, if you believe God is a rule maker, your focus this year will be on what you do for God. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and I won't do this and I won't do that. But if you're primarily understanding that God is a grace maker, It's that you are resting in, collapsing on what Christ has already done for you, and there's a difference. If you primarily believe that God is a rule maker, you'll be driven with, I have to. If you believe he's a grace giver, you'll say, I get to. Earlier, first service, Jim, I was asking backstage, Jim, why? You've been a Christian quite a while. He said, well, I I wanted to humble myself and be obedient And I wanted to model for my family humility and obedience to the gospel. That's why I'm getting baptized. I said, that's awesome. I said, Jim, I'm going to hold you under a little extra long. I'm just letting you know. (laughs) He said, I humbly accept that. If you believe God is a rule maker, you're going to live in bondage and shame the rest of your life. Because you'll never measure up. I couldn't. I've never taken a drug. I've never smoked marijuana. I've never had sex with anyone but my wife, and I couldn't measure up. I was cleaning out two of three garages this week. Remember, it was a hangover, right? And pressure cleaning our circle driveway, and I found some filthy rags. For me, they're filthy, but that's what filthy rags are for, to clean up dirty stuff. And I was reminded, by the way, I always want to save a filthy rag because of the next filth. My wife always wants me to throw them away. Have you ever had those fights? Okay, another conversation. And I was reflecting on that rag. I was sitting in my garage. And the Bible says that your righteousness, my righteousness, your best stuff, my best stuff is like, you ready for this? It's like a filthy rag. That's why you'll never measure up on your own. So you may as well stop trying and start trusting and stop seeing God primarily as a rule maker, but much more as a grace giver. See, the answer to this question, how do you view God, can determine the future course of how you live your life. Are you going to live in bondage and shame or the fullness of freedom rest? It's that important. Because why? Because grace changes everything. What we're doing at West Cobb this year is not a game that we play. We're not a church that says, let's see how often we can sit in rows and sing some nice songs and hear some nice sermonettes about Christianettes who shouldn't smoke cigarettes. Jesus said, this is life. Life more abundant than you've ever dreamed of. He says, come to me, and I will give you rest for your weary soul, your life. I will give you, I, you thirst, but I will, I will quench your thirst so that you thirst no more. And we're going to dive deeply into the riches of God's grace. I hope you'll join me for it. 
And I hope you discover what I ultimately discovered, which was that in spite of all my best religious efforts, I had been made totally acceptable and perfectly righteous solely on the merit of what Christ had done for me on the cross, not based on how good I was gonna be as a little Christian. No amount of hand-wringing, no amount of my performance, no amount of my religious attempts to get right and stay right with God would ever compare to what God the Father had done by sending his one and only son to do for me what I could never do for myself because he unconditionally loved me, forgave me, and accepted me just the way I was. That changed everything for me. And it changed everything later for my wife. She'd heard all her life, yes, Jesus loves me, sang that song, yes, Jesus loves me, but she didn't know until she was 30 years old, really know, yes, Jesus loves me. It is only because of Christ, it is only because of grace that you were lavishly loved, unconditionally accepted, completely forgiven, perfectly made righteous, and gloriously free, and it's all because of Jesus. It's none of you. Yeah, but I'm going to help God out this year. Let me know how that works. Now you, every one of you are more sinful than you ever dare imagine. And you are more loved and accepted than you ever dare hope for. That's why there's a prescriptive word before grace for most people. A number of years ago now, we took our granddaughter Ella to the movie, Frozen. How'd you like the movie? Amazing. A few weeks ago, we were in East Texas over Thanksgiving. Esri now, going to Frozen 2. How'd you like the movie? Amazing. I can't think of a better word for grace than a better prescriptive, a better amazing. What's so amazing about grace? It's amazing. It's breathtaking. It's the greatest power in the universe. Why? Because it changes everything. Has it changed you? Has there been a moment in your life where you've received grace? You've invited Christ to forgive you of all your sins, to take over your life, to to surrender or resurrender your life to him. If not, why not? Yeah, I know there's a lot of good news preachers, but a lot of times they won't tell you what I'm about to tell you. There's also some bad news. You and I are sinners in need of a savior. We are guilty, you know. A lot of people think of the church as a bunch of good people getting together because they're good people. Actually, we're a bunch of guilty people getting together for grace. Years ago, a Palm Beach Post newspaper guy said, could I meet with you? I know you're a pastor of a contemporary church. I want to meet with you. He said, what's your best definition of the church? I said, you ready? The church is a colossal collection of moral foul-ups who gather together for grace. He goes, seriously? I said, yeah. We don't have our act together, but we know who does. You know, we did a series a long time ago called Crazy Stuff Christians Say. You know what one of them is? God will never give you more than you can handle. There's a Greek word for that, baloney. In fact, I'm quite sure right now, you got so many challenges in front of you that you're going to need God to help you handle them. That's called all-sufficient grace in your time of need. Friends, the whole story of Christianity is the story of a perfect God helping imperfect people like me and you because of grace. And if you've never received his grace, why not? Why not now? And if you have, West Cobb, on this first Sunday of a brand new year, don't waste any more time on say, I'm going to try harder and I'm going to do more. Instead, let's collapse on Christ. Let's rest in the full, finished work of Christ. Let's reaffirm our moment-by-moment need for grace for today and grace for tomorrow. And let's surrender to what the Spirit of God wants to do in us and through us.
personally and corporately as we create a culture of grace because grace changes everything. Would you bow with me for prayer? Our glorious Father in heaven, out of your crazy love for us, you sent for us your one and only Son to be what we could never be, to do what we could never do, to live how we could never live, to die a death in our place as our substitute, to appease you, Father, of all your wrath against our junk, our stuff, our sin, our shame. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. And today, if you're here, you wonder, why did God bring me here on the first Sunday of a brand new year? Here's why. God loves you too much to let you go. And this is your year. This is a year of protection and provision. This is a year of, you ready? This is a year of grace. Grace for today. Grace for tomorrow. Saving grace and sustaining grace. And so, Father... Some of you need to say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. By faith, I invite you in. I receive a free gift called grace. Thank you for it. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it, but I'll take it, Jesus. Help me grow in it now. Help it transform my life. Help it change everything, including my eternity, making heaven my home. And Father, for those of us who've been around a long, long time, this thing called church, I pray, Jesus, that you'd help us grow deeper and deeper and deeper in your amazing grace. Our attitude, our identity, our generosity, our perspective, our everything. Thank you, Jesus. In your radical, grace-giving name we pray.